It's very interesting to see the Burberry post there. It gives me a perfect link. Um, some years ago, I did a, uh, a training course for the business analysts at Burberry. I don't know if there's any of you with Burberry, are you? And uh, one of the things I'm about to talk about here, and one of the things I try to emphasize on my courses is let's think about the value of things. Let's think about the value of things you're creating. Let's get away from this cost. How much will it cost? When will it be ready? Let's think about how much is this worth? How much will it be worth when it's ready on a particular date? And we're gonna talk about this. And Burberry is a fantastic example do you think, when you walk, ladies more than men here, you, when you're shopping for your men and you walk into the Burberry shop, do you think Burberry price their coats on the basis of cost? No. <laughs> yeah, obvious, isn't it? So why do we get into these situations where people say, how much will it cost to build this software? Shouldn't we be saying, how much is this software worth? How much value will this software unlock to our customers, to our internal business people? And given they will unlock that much value, given that we can sell a Burberry coat for a thousand pounds, how much of that thousand pound shall we spend on designing and making the Burberry coat, on designing and building the software? The equation is the wrong way around for many of us. And those of you who quote for work, Suppose you've got a client who comes to you and says, how long will it take to build, ah, and how much will, ah, cost? And you do all your diligent estimating and costing and everything else. You go through all that rational process and you come up with a figure and you give it to your sales guy. Does your sales guy take that figure to the customer? Or does he say, the customer will never pay that, I'm gonna halve it. Or perhaps he's saying, you know what? This customer will pay twice as much as that. Let's double it. Yeah? The price you pay for something and the cost it needs the cost you pay to produce it are completely different things. And that's why I want to hopefully surprise you with some stuff here. But Burberry is a great example. I hope when you quote for the Burberry work, you didn't work out how much it's gonna cost the bill, because they do not do that, I guarantee you that. Um, Although they don't actually produce their stuff in China. They have some factories up north, I believe. Um, so how much when? Um, if you've not met me before, this is me. Um, I think if I had my way, I'd sit at home and write books. And now with the wonders of lean publishing, I can publish electronic books much more easily. You know, you can write books by accident. <laughs> this book was more or less written by accident. I, I started playing around a lean pub because some friends had, and I kind of got addicted to it. Probably lean publishers, you don't know when a book's finished. Finally, I decided it needed to be printed. And when you start printing things, they're difficult to change. When they're ebooks, people get an email saying there's an update. And so I finished it and I decided it needed a proper professional cover. Um, and what you might tell, the, the, the earlier version, my crude homemade cover, is a lot easier to spot. But those of you who know King's Cross Station, this is actually a picture of the, the roof at King's Cross. King's Cross was built by real engineers. It was built by real engineers in Victorian times and it was rebuilt by real engineers, not software engineers, in the last 10 years. How many months was King's Cross closed? How much of King's Cross was thrown away? If you've been to King's Cross Elite and you look around, not a lot of it, and it was closed for a few weekends, trains were diverted, King's Cross Station was more or less kept open every day during the rebuild. So next time a software engineer tells you, we need to throw this code away and start again, because we're real engineers, remind them what real engineers do. Reading Station's my other favorite. It closed for a few weekends, but the trains generally kept running. I was going through Reading Station a lot um, on my way to and from Cornwall while they were rebuilding it, and it was amazing. The station was just being rebuilt at night, at weekends, and they kept, that's what real engineers do. Real engineers very rarely throw away complete stations, complete bridges, and start again. Um, so, um, but anyway, uh, and my latest accidental book is on user stories. <laughs> I, uh, 
I find I end up giving the same advice on user stories again and again and again. And I had a flight to Dallas, and I thought it's an ideal opportunity to write down what advice. And I expected I was going to get three or four thousand words out of it at most. By the time we landed, I had like ten thousand words. The time on the way to Dallas flew by, but then what do I do with it? And I edited it into a series of articles that appeared in Agile Connection. You can go and Google them, look them up. And I thought, well, I can't just leave them there, so I rolled them into a book. You can write books by accident, it's, it's awful. Um, so, um, how many of you come across this question? Is this project right for Waterfall or Agile? Yeah, I can see some heads nodding. Yeah, um, it's a very common question. And it's bollocks. It doesn't matter. The real question is, who cares about right? When was the last time your organisation did what was right because the engineers said it was right? Or you, business analysts, said it was right? The question is, which will make the most money? And I will suggest Agile will make money more or less every time. And it makes money simply because if you're doing Agile and you're doing it well, you are making multiple deliveries. <clears throat> it's not one big bang delivery, you're delivering a little and often. Um, Agile makes more money because it delivers something, anything, sooner. A little bit sooner is worth more than a lot later. Imagine, I've got the spreadsheet behind this if you want to see. Imagine you're doing a one year project, estimate take one year, and it's going to cost you a million dollars. If you do it with one delivery at the end, it may well make you, what's that, uh, what have I put in here, $225,000. If you do the same, spend the same money, but instead you release a little bit every month. Every month there's a partial delivery, one twelfth of the software. One twelfth of the software gets delivered and starts earning you money. That means at the end of January you've got a bit of revenue, you've got a bit of cost saving. At the end of February you've got a bit more revenue, you've got a bit more cost saving and every month you get a twelfth. If you do your ROI calculations properly you will find that you have got yourself an extra $27,000 or 2.75%. I know it doesn't sound that much. I probably could have rigged the figures to give you a bigger headline number, but let's try this. How would your mortgage feel if it was 2.7% up? What if instead of holding interest rates today, the Bank of England had rocketed them up 2.75%? I think you'd feel it, wouldn't you? It'd be pretty painful. 2.7% is actually pretty significant in business terms. Um, so although it may only be $27,000, it's better than a kick in the teeth. I could have exaggerated the numbers if I'd wanted to. I've been kind of honest here. Doing lots of little deliveries incrementally brings you revenue in. Um, if you talk to most Agile folks, most Scrum Master, product owner courses, whatever, you will hear regular deliveries are good because they give you more opportunities for feedback. You get to show it to your customers, you show it to your users, you can validate your hypothesis, you can get feedback on the user interface. You can get feedback on whether it's what they really wanted. True, you will hear you'll get tighter feedback loops generally. Feedback, Agile's all about feedback loops. You will hear that it will allow for changing requirements because if somebody asks for something and you get six months in and they want something different, you can do something different. True, but it misses the point. You will hear that you get improved quality and this is true. People say Agile improves quality. That's kind of the wrong way around. You can't really work Agile if you have low quality. You know all those Gantt charts you've got your project plans? Where does it show you're going to discover the bugs? Where does it have bug discovered here, bug discovered here? Sure, you have a testing phase on there, but at any stage, any day, a bug can put up its hand and say, I'm here, fix me. The truth is, if you don't have high quality, if you don't do the technical practices, you can't really work Agile. You'll also hear from Agile folks that Agile reduces risk. It's true, but it kind of misses the point. That's not, they're not the important points. The important point is Agile will increase value. Agile people talk about all these things on the left and say, how do I explain this to my boss? How do I explain this to my manager? How do I explain this to the business? Because the business don't care about opportunities for feedback and tighter feedback loops and changing requirements because they think they got it right in the first place. 
They think when they told you 12 months ago, they told you the truth. And any minor changes is probably because you got it wrong listening to them. And they don't worry about improved quality because you're supposed to do good quality in the first place, aren't you? And they don't worry about reduced risk because, you know, you told them when you got to work that you were going to reduce the risk. Look, it increases value. That's the key thing here. It will make you more money. Yes, it will do all of these things on the left, but these are the key points. So, agile folk get it wrong. Emphasize the money. <sighs> Let's do some audience participation. You've all done your scrum courses. You all know how to prioritize stories. So, if I give you these two stories, and I've put value on these stories, most stories in the real world don't have value on them. We're going to talk about that later, but I think you need to get value on your stories. Imagine you have this story. As a toy retailer, I want an app that allows kids to select from my special range so their parents can buy. This is worth $355,000, and we know because we're really good, it'll take four weeks. There's a similar story. As a toy retailer, I want an app that allows kids to make lists of toys they want to buy so, want so their parents can buy. This one's worth a bit over a million dollars, but it'll take six weeks to develop. Which do you want to do first? I know you're all doing the calculation. Divide 355 by four. <laughs> it's what, about 80,000? Divide at one million by six. Ooh, that's about 150,000. Which do you want to do? I go for the top one. Top one? All in one? Yeah. Shall I give you some more information? <laughs> what do you think now? <laughs> ah, that is the key question, isn't it? <laughs> now, which one do you want to do? We need to think about the time value profile. How does value change? How does that 355,000 or 1 million and 60,000 change over time? There's your Santa app. Today's September the 1st. If you deliver it any time between now and September the 15th, it's worth the full 1 million and 60,000. After September the 15th, the value starts to drop off. If you deliver it by the end of November, you will make a million in total. Delivering it after the 22nd of December, well, you've lost most of the European market, and even the Russians aren't ordering toys by the time you get to January the 5th. So there's a little bit of value to be made in the tail, but not a lot. The value really drops off after November, October. All through November, you're losing value day on day. So... There's the val total value. Yeah, this is the total value. This is our six weeks, value starts to drop off. So if we start now, we can capture most of that value. If we start later, here's Halloween. Same deal. For the next two weeks, the value doesn't change. After the 15th of September, the value starts to drop off. You know, once you get to the end of October, the value falls off. This is telling you that most of the use of this app is going to be right at the end of October. And here, we're in England. Kids confuse Halloween and Guy Fawkes Night. Um, so, you know, you deliver it here, no value whatsoever. So, there you are, four weeks. You can capture most of that value. Perhaps not all of it. So, there you go, if that helps. Which do you want to do? I think I'll work the other way around as well, if that helps. Your options are, do Halloween and forget Santa. Do Santa and forget Halloween. Do Halloween then Santa, or do Santa and then Halloween. Change the estimates. <laughs> we laugh. I've had that suggested a couple of times, both here in this presentation and in real life. Any of you honest enough to say you wouldn't come under pressure to change the estimates? 
Not that you would, but people you work with might. Yeah. Does changing the estimates actually change the amount of time? Ah, the reuse one. Uh, have I got that on here? Come to that in a moment. So you could you could do both and pray, you know, because there's a lot of there's a lot of product managers and product owners and project managers in the world who believe if you do them both in parallel, you double your capacity. That, that's, that's obviously true, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I, I, it wasn't that long ago. I actually stood in a planning meeting and the senior product manager was in the room and faced with a similar choice. He said, couldn't we do both? <laughs> And he's like, oh God, you, you, you're really suggesting you want two things, long and slow rather than one. Oh God, how he, got, how he keeps his job, I don't know. Um, add more people. Um, don't know about you, but hiring people around here is a bit difficult, isn't it? Yeah, that's really not an option. So reuse, someone suggested shared functionality. Before we talk about the reuse option, anybody know off the top of their heads how much extra reusable code costs over single-use code? 25%. 25%? Is that a good feel or...? Yeah. The only person I know who's really on record as saying something is Fred Brooks, so this is from 1974. Mythical Man Month, he says, reusable code costs three times as much as single-use code. I believe Kevin Henney told me he's seen an article, but he can't find the reference that he found an article where a study said it's 1.8 times as much. So the question is how much of the Halloween can be reused? I mean, the way I've presented the user stories, it looks like a lot. But we'd have to think about that. How much of Santa can be taken from Halloween? So how much of Halloween would be suitable for reuse and how much of Santa could be taken from Halloween? And then there's a the question of intellectual property. If you are a service company and you're building a Halloween app for that customer and the Santa app for that customer, could you do that? Yeah? Like certainly the likes of Accenture make a very good business from building things for one customer, then going and selling the same people to another customer to build exactly the same thing. Yeah, um, you might lose out there. Um, Yeah, you see, I'm old enough to remember when the things we call microservices we talked about as components. <laughs> and I'm even old enough to remember when components were libraries. And the software industry regularly reinvents the reuse paradigm in different ways. Admittedly, they're getting smaller and smaller, and we are getting better at it. But it's not necessarily the technological solution. We'd, we'd need to know more about what it was. And you're probably right, probably probably microservices have a different profile to components, which have a different profile from static libraries, which have a different program profile to other things. There's probably something else to add to the mix here. We probably need to study it. I think, I don't, I, if you know of a study where someone studied code reuse costs, I'd love to know about it. Because we talk about code reuse being this panacea, but the very little evidence you can see is it's actually quite expensive until you get to reusing it. If you are the first person, if you're the first app, how much longer is it going to take? Um, how much extra does it reusable code cost to write? How much extra, how much money is lost by that? If making Halloween reusable takes twice as long, then it's not going to be ready for Halloween. You lose all the value for Halloween. I don't know. We need, it's a number we don't know. Um, how much money do we lose in the delay? How much money is then, we could lose a lot of money in Halloween, we could recoup it on Santa. But again, we'd need to do some analysis here. We'd need to think about these numbers. And then the big one, you increase risk for both. Suppose we say Halloween is gonna be rewritten in a reusable fashion. And suppose we say, think we can capture most of our value from Halloween and we can still reuse the code in Santa now means that Santa is dependent on Halloween being a success. If the Halloween app goes belly up, if the Halloween app takes a lot longer, potentially we get to the 31st of October. We have no Halloween app, we've lost all the value from the Halloween app, and we have a code base which is useless for Santa. 
and we then lose the Santa market entirely. Because starting on 31st of October to write Santa is going to take us into the middle of November, into the middle of December, and the value's gone. So writing one to be reusable increases the risk of both. We love reusable code, but we don't think about reusable code right. A friend of mine, Kevlin Henney, has a great line. Has, There's no such thing as reusable code. There's only code which has been reused. Absolutely, if we have code and we think we can reuse it, we should reuse it. But writing reusable code, writing code which we believe will be reused, is a highly dangerous ground to be on. The C lib? Yeah. Yes. <coughs> It was written in 1972 and has been refined over 40 years. Yeah. On the other hand, so are all the C++ string classes. I expect we've got mainly business analysts, product owners hypes in the room, so this is going to be really boring for you. In most programming languages, there's a thing called a string, letters. In our fact, my old language, C++, you have special classes to do this. Um, there's a lot of these classes. They're all written to be reusable. There's um, the best known Microsoft one, C string. There's the ISO standard standard string. There's a thing called boost string. There's a thing from a vendor called Rogue Wave. There's things, there was something in the ACE framework called ACE string. There, I, I can probably name a dozen different C++ string classes just here now. In addition, almost everybody who's ever programmed C++ has at some point said, I keep writing strings, I will write a string class to end all string classes that will always be reused. I would suggest the number of C++ string classes that have been written, divided by the number of occasions those classes actually have been reused, is probably close to zero. Um, a few of them have been reused you know, thousands, tens of thousands of times, and lots of them have never been reused. And if you look at the, the ISO standard string class in C++, it's massive. It's a nightmare to maintain. It's full of functions that never get used. It's a nightmare to learn. So absolutely, there are some libraries which you can reuse. But I would argue the C library is reusable because it has been matured over years and it has been reused again and again and we've tinkered with it. When we set out to write code to be reused, we more often than not end up a mess. Yeah? Not necessarily, I would argue, because if you define an interface cleanly, for example, sort, you don't care how the sort's done, you care about the results. And over time, the underlying, hard, the underlying software can be modified and improved. That's not, strictly speaking, reuse. It's a way in, but I agree with you completely, but the key word there was over time. You can achieve reuse over time by modifying things. But you can do it by defining the interface as cleanly in the first place. You should be defining the interface cleanly in the first place anyway, which gives you the option of a later date of reusing yes. it. Agreed. Yes. The point is, is that by thinking we may want to reuse this in the future, we'll define a clean interface now. No. If you time. think we may want to use this in future, there is every chance you will add extra functionality for somebody to use in future, you lose your focus. When you're writing it, write it good now, put a good interface on it. If you do a good job, somebody may well reuse it. If you don't do a good job, you haven't got the option. It's not about reusability, that's just about writing good code. We digress on a minor point. It's just simply, you may have a situation where, you put in a bubble sort, because it's quick and fast and you do it now. You know in the future that it's got a good interface, you can go back later and put in a better sort. But that's not about reuse, that so is about modifying the code, no, that's about, about maintainability. It's about reuse, because it means my application can use that interface, and when it changes it will improve without me... You do, not, you do not need to invoke reuse to do that. That is a good thing to do, period. Stop. Yeah? You don't need to play the reuse card. I think many developers play the reusable code because they want to do that. They want to write code with a good interface, highly cohesive, lowly coupled, high quality code. Testable. Testable code. The other way around. I'm saying you can write shit code now, but we'll fix it in the future. 
I'm not saying you write shit code no, I'm not now. I'm saying you can do that. You can say I'll use a bubble sort now because I know in the future if we use this, we can improve it. But right if, now, if, if, you're weeks, the, I'll use a bubble sort. If you're the kind of person who writes shit code, you probably haven't got to put a good no, interface on it. With time. If I know that I've got to get a product out the door within four weeks, then I may want to put it in a simple algorithm because I know I can get that to work now and test it. Yes. But if the interface is correct, if I, use that, if I reuse that interface, I can improve what's behind it I'm happy to have the debate. I'd rather not have it right now because there's some more. But let us just leave it. That reuse is a very debatable subject. Okay. Therefore, I'm just striking it off the list. <laughs> What's your preference? Anyone care to express a preference on what we do? Do both. Do both and pray. <laughs> yeah, because you know those developers, you can't really trust them, can you? Uh, now, if we do Santa first and Halloween second, Santa will finish here. We'll capture most of the Santa value, but by the time Halloween finishes, the value will be declining fast. Um, Santa first. The Santa app makes $1,025,000. We can't make all the $160,000 because it takes six weeks to develop whenever we start, and on f September the 1st, six weeks means we've lost some of the value. Okay? But by the time we start Halloween, Halloween doesn't have any value. Okay? We deliver it so late. <laughs> on the other hand, so there you go, that's what I said. But on the other hand, if we begin Halloween here, and then Santa, it's kind of interesting. Halloween first, we deliver the Halloween app. Again, we can't have it ready by the 15th of September, so the value we get is not the total value we could have got, but we can capture most of the value, $340,000. We can then move on and do the Santa app. Now, because we start the Santa app late, it's not ready until the 10th of November, and we do lose $225,000, which is a shame, but in total, we make more money. In total, we make 800000 from the Santa, 340000 from the Halloween, so we make 1.14. Yeah. Santa first means no Halloween, just over a million. Halloween first means we can do Halloween and then Santa, and we can make $115,000 more. Yeah? Is there a risk mitigation that you might want to do in that as well? So it's not that there's obviously quite a bit of variability. You may not get it done in four weeks. And if there's a, a sudden decline in the half a week after four weeks or whatever, yeah. so not just working out the simple numbers, but also saying, do you know what, if we do this one, it's definitely in the bag. Yeah, yeah. There's all, there's all sorts of more analysis you can layer on top of this. And one of the things I want to do is put some more analysis specific around the reuse on here and the risk thing, because you've still got those feedback cycles. You, if you got halfway through the Halloween app and you found it was dragging, you could can it and move straight onto the Santa. You've still got those options. There's all sorts of more analysis you could do here. It's, it's almost, there's almost as much analysis as you have imagination. Um, the key thing is to think about what we call the cost of delay or opportunity cost of delay. Um, my problem with cost of delay, it's been in the literature for a few years, is that people think cost of delay kind of means the extra money you spend because something is late. Because you don't have the new call centre oper software operating, you need to have a load more temps in the call centre. This is not cost of delay. Cost of delay really means the revenue, the income, the benefit you're missing because something is late. So it's not, well, extra costs and care because it's late are included, but really, it's the value foregone. You've lost revenue opportunities. In this case, the Halloween app may not generate the money you want, or the Santa app um, doesn't generate enough. Um, not being in the market. If you've got a competitor coming to market, oh, sorry, yeah, less time on sale. This is the one I started to talk about. Not being available before a competitor comes in the market. If you know a competitor is entering the market, 
You know, the cost to delay, cost of being after the competitor is going to be significant. Being before is good. Um, you know, there may be critical dates like Christmas, like Halloween, like the summer season. You know, I, I, I booked a summer holiday through a website, you know, if there's extra functionality there to make me spend more money and it's not there in the holiday booking season, you know, Christmas is obvious. But if you think about your businesses, lots of your businesses have these seasonal cycles. So, um, you know, finance is the obvious one. End of financial year. If you work for a British company, it's probably around April. If you work for an American company, it's probably December the 31st. You also have things like shows, exhibits in your market. Maybe you have to show at a particular, you have to be in a particular show to exhibit your new products. You know, there's all sorts of business cycles and you want to identify the key dates and how they relate to the benefit value you're going to get. So think about cost of delay, not so much as the extra costs because you're late, but the value or revenue for gone, the benefits for gone. Um, the old adage, time is money. We tend to think more time means more costs. More importantly, more time means less revenue. More time means less time on sale, less time before a critical date, less time before your competitors enter the market. All sorts of ways, it's true. Time is money. More time, less money. Um, let me suggest that revenue is in per, inversely proportional to the cost of delay. To the, the time, like, oh, it's late, I've eaten pizza. <laughs> revenue is inversely proportional to the time to delivery. The sooner you can deliver it, in most cases, the more money you will make. The later you deliver it, the less money you will make. Um, this is the guy who did the original analysis, a guy called Don Reinertsen. Uh, his his uh, book, Principles of Product Development Flow, is well worth reading. It's tough going, and there's a lot of maths in places, but it's worth reading. Um, back when he worked for McKinsey, he came up with this figure, which is like 30 years ago now. 30 years? Yeah. Six months delay in a product development can be worth 33% of the cycle profits, by which he means from going on sale to it being end of life being in the market six months earlier, which probably means six months earlier end, you can make 33% more. Time to market is important. That early time can be particularly critical. Um, so today's lesson, a little bit sooner is worth more than a lot later. Lesson number two know the time value profile of the thing you are building. How does the value change over time? If the value doesn't change over time, brilliant, go and do something else where the value is important. There's lots of work in your companies to do. If you've got something that doesn't matter whether you deliver it tomorrow or in six months time, delay doing it and do something else which is going to expire. Um, I met um, some people from a, um, a company in France a couple of months ago, and they've got a great way of talking about this, I need to incorporate, and they talk about best before dates and, and sell by dates, and it's like food packaging. You know, there's a best before date. You can buy those donuts before the best before date, if you eat them, they'll be great. There may be you know, a sell by date, a day after which eating those donuts is poisonous. Some things will have drop dead deadlines, excuse the pun, you know, they have sell-by dates. If you don't sell them by that date, there's no point. They're dangerous, they're tasteless. Others have best before dates. After that date, they may still be edible, they may still taste good, maybe not so good as they did. So know the time value profile. Lesson number three. Deadlines are elastic by value. These days when I do presentations, I have to wait for the photographs to be taken before I continue. And I can prove deadlines are elastic by value because many of you will have had this. Okay, no, not, that's the next slide. And um, deadlines are actually analog. De deadlines are analog. Their value changes. Different delivery dates produces different values. Um, have you ever met one of these people? I need this, I need it now! 
I did it yesterday! Yeah? Yeah, you, you've met this guy, have you? The correct answer when you hear this is to get in your TARDIS. Um, do any of you have a TARDIS? No. I believe Siemens are working on one, but, you know, I don't know when it'll be ready. Um, see, that's the value profile. Yesterday, it was worth a lot of money. He needed it by yesterday. All the value is now gone. There is no point in doing this. The value has gone. Delivering it tomorrow, even today, is pointless. Oh dear, you say. Um, but usually you reply something like this. You say, oh dear, I don't have a TARDIS, but maybe I can get something for you by tomorrow. That's what you say, isn't it? And he says, brilliant, I knew I could count on you. There's some value left. There is some value. He, he's he's practising decibel management. He is claiming that it, you know, it's really urgent. What you need to know is not about a time value, because if he really needs something by tomorrow, you may well do something different than if he needs something by next week, or if he needs something by a month's time. If you know how his value is going to decline and how much of the thing you can build can capture that value, you know, if he's asking you for this to capture this much value, but you haven't got time to build this, building this may well capture some of that value. This, you can change what you're building. I've got another exercise I do with, with groups sometimes. And I divide the room up. We need, we need a bit more time to do this. And we'll have, you know, we'd, we'd have like two teams on each side of the room. And I, I put up on here a story that says, I want an online shop to sell widgets. And I give the people on this side of the room a story that says, as an international widget maker, I want to cut out the distributors. I want to sell my widgets direct to my customers. I believe within three years I can sell 10 million worth of widgets and I can make $2 million a year. I have budgeted $1.2 million for this project. And I asked the people on this side of the room to pretend they are an outsourcer and they've been asked to bid for this project. And I go to the people on this side of the room and I give them a use, they don't know they've got a different story. The people on this side of the room get a used story that says, as a home-based artisan widget maker, I want to sell widgets to Joe Public so that I can give up my day job. If I can make $100,000 a year in the next couple of years, I can give up my day job. My accountant tells me I can get an online website for $5,000 and I want an online shopping site. Essentially the same story about selling things online, but they are, coach, they are, they are described with different numbers. And do you know what happens? The teams on this side of the room, without fail, come back and talk about projects that are months long and at least cost hundreds of thousands of dollars to implement. There was a, did this with a group in, in um, where was I, in Romania the other week, and one of the teams on this side of the room wanted $1.6 million over three years for the system. And I get the people with the big story to read out, and while they're reading it out, the people on this side of the room, who don't know they've got a different story, can't help themselves laughing. I did this in, in, in Krakow in Poland a couple of weeks ago, and there's some guys this side of the, they were in hysterics. They, they didn't know what these guys were doing. They thought they had the same story. And the guys on this side of the room will come up and say, yeah, we need $10,000, $5,000. That's a WordPress site with a Magento plugin. That's what we'll do. We, 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 we can have it for you next week sometimes, or in a couple of weeks' time, you know. Yeah, and, and people will argue with me that actually I've described different systems, that there's more security requirements over here. They will argue there's different standards of image, of graphic design, etc. And that may all be true. And it's all things you should be asking about. But, you know, what we're saying is there's different ways of solving the same problem, depending on the value and what is needed. And if what you need to get that money is needed now, you may well take a WordPress site with a Magento plugin and sell for an international company because you could get something smaller sooner. It may not give you all the value, but it'll give you some of the value. If you set off on that three-year project to seek out and, and, and you explore strange new e-commerce systems, by the time you deliver your perfect system to capture $5 million, the market may well have gone. Um, so, 
If the value accrued yesterday, then it's lost. If there's value, it's still worth doing something. Um, so how do you get to value? This is the difficult question. And as I mentioned earlier on, most user stories I've ever seen don't have value on them. And strictly speaking, it's not value. Value is nice because it's a number, it's dollars, it's pounds, it's euros. But it's some description of business benefit. That's, that's nice. I once had um, somebody from the International Development Ministry Agency, whatever, on a course, and they said value to us is people drinking clean water. That's fine. That's acceptable. Just define what value is. Most of you work for commercial organisations. It's pounds, shillings and pence. You did hear we're going back after Brexit. <laughs> yeah. Um, one way is simply go and ask your stakeholders. Those people who you are building this for, go and ask them, what is this worth? What difference will this make? And how will this value change over time? You could go and do the analysis. And I think it'd be great if you can go and do the analysis. You can go and do the market research. You can put the numbers together. You can factor in the interest rates, the inflation rate, etc., etc., etc. The catch with that is I pretty much guarantee if somebody wants to find fault with your analysis, they will. Someone will always say, but you know, you've forgotten to factor in the second referendum when the pound goes up and the exchange rates change and somebody will find something that invalidates your research. It's good. I encourage you to do it. But be aware. The other way, uh, the way I've been using recently is estimate it. After all, if it's acceptable for developers to estimate how long it'll take to build something, why shouldn't we estimate how much something is worth? So I invent a currency and I play value poker um, and I play it like Dragon's Den. Um, and uh, I've, you know, this is a picture of a law firm kind of in that direction where we did this a few weeks ago. Um, and the, uh, the business analyst read out the user stories and the, some representatives of the law firm had planning poker cards and I told them their cards were denominated in thousands of business points. And uh, so we'd read out the user story, ask some questions and then we'd do the old voting, just like you've probably seen developers do with planning poker. And we'd see what the numbers were and we'd talk about them and we'd come to some agreement or we'd average them. And as they agreed the numbers, I wrote the numbers on there and I laid them out so we could see the order on these stories. Um, and whenever we got the same value, suppose we, um, there's a 5,000 there. If we got another 5,000, I'd say, this one you've just read, it has, you've given it 5,000, the same as this one here. Should it be a bit more, like 5,500, or a bit less, like 4,900? You know, how far down? And we, we saw the relative values compared to each other. Um, the business analysts that come into the room with four envelopes, she, she'd Moscowed them. This was just the musts. Down here you'll see there's a bunch of zero value stories. There were stories where the BA and the product manager had thought they were really valuable. They were in the must have envelope and the client has given them zero value. There's one story the client actually said, tear it up here and now. Yeah. There were a couple of other stories that went right off the scale. They came from the should have envelope. Um, this isn't a cure-all, but it's a way of having a very good conversation. It's a way of measuring up the values. As I say, I, I normally play Dragon's Den style, so I get a couple of people, usually product owner, product manager type people, to play the entrepreneurs. You've all seen the show. They come up in the lift. They go and they, they pitch. I get them to pitch the system, and I get them to pitch individual user stories, and I get the other people to play dragons, and they get to quiz them. And it's great if you can do it with other business people, other product owners, senior management. It's also quite good if you, can, if you can't get them, just do it with your developers and testers. Because they, they pull information out of you, they ask questions. And some of those questions are useful on the requirements and specification side. And sometimes they see things that you as a brilliant BA product owner won't have seen. And it's a bit of fun. And you also discover even unwashed developers are often picked up a lot of business language from watching TV. Um, so, um, once you know the value, you know the profile, yeah? Um, just one yeah. on that. Um, so I work for a, an international NGO, and um, you have, like, we all have projects coming on. Some are a bit like that, you know, what value to you is clean yeah. water. Some of them are like that. Yeah. Others are, we could make an extra 
10,000 pounds a day on our donations platform if we do this. Yeah. And some of them are business essential. If we don't do this, Windows XP goes out of service collection because we're five years late doing an update. Yeah. Um, so how can you... Like, with the point, yeah. quite difficult, because there's different well, and they don't agree. Well, I would actually, also, I'd actually argue the opposite. I would argue that this is one way of homogenizing that, because actually what you're trying to compare is apples and oranges. You're saying if we don't phase out XP, we, we can't keep up the day-to-day -day operations, but it doesn't actually add any value. On the other hand, if we have uh, an online donation system, we can bring money in the door. On the other hand, we can fulfill our basic mission like this. If you put a collection of those stakeholders in the room <coughs> and you get them to value it, they then have the conversation. And you know, the person who's high, putting a high value on phasing out XP can say, look, if we don't do this, we aren't going to be up it. We're going to be vulnerable to viruses. We're going to be blah, 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 blah. And they can explain their point of view to, to the fundraiser over here who's saying, we need more money, we need more money. And they'll both get to hear the person saying, well, we need to actually support our field operation. And they have the conversation. And for you, they may come up with an, a nominal, and it's another reason for not using real money, come up with some nominal value way of comparing these things. Because you're right, that's, that's going to be a really difficult one. But unless you bring those people together and have, let them talk, you're always going to be cast in the bad light. Because are you the right person to decide whether it's operational phasing out XP, raising more money, or fulfilling the overall objective. And whatever decision you come to, the other ones are going to criticize you. At best, you'll, you'll satisfy one person and two won't. If you put them in the same room, and you at least have the conversation, um, they've, they've, they've heard each other's point of view. And if you come up with something like that, you do not have to follow this slavishly from top to bottom. Oh, you probably do if you work in an investment bank, you know. but. This is another conversation point to say, look, this is how we've valued them. Is this right? Is it right that that has come out below that? It's, it's a way of having that conversation. So I agree it's difficult, but it's a difficult problem. Um, so once you, know, once you know what something is worth and you know how the time how the value, the benefit will change over time. You can then think about, well, how, what kind of solution can we build to obtain as much of that value as possible? We may be able to build a solution in half the time that delivers 80% of the value, you know, the old Pareto principle. But if you don't have a number on there, I find talking about how value changes over time an impossible conversation. It's too abstract. If you're saying, I've got this thing, I don't know how much it's worth. I don't know how much it's worth in six months' time. If you put a number, almost get your dice out and roll the dice. You can at least talk about how that number might change over time. Without a number on there, people find it too abstract. So put a number on there and talk about what solutions you can build within those constraints to recognize that value and leave some profit or whatever it is your organization does within that time frame. Um, you know, how much profit is made and how much value is extracted are all negotiable. You know, the, the value that you actually get out of this thing is going to depend on both on when you deliver it and how much you deliver. But that's a negotiation you want to have. Um, so know these things, time value, profit targets, your objectives. That's another thing about the, the For those of you who work in commercial organization where you want to make profit and pay dividends, it's dead easy. It's how do we make money? It's the other organizations, it's the non-government organizations, it's even government departments, where your objectives and your strategy can be more difficult to define. Where you, you, you need to line up the kind of values you're talking about here with what your organization is saying is there to do and what their strategy and their own values are. Um, once you know that, well, this is where engineers come in. This is what engineers do. Engineers build things within constraints. As I said about King's Cross and Reading Station earlier on, you know, an engineer might have said, I'd like to bulldoze King's Cross and build a wonderful new perfect station here. Which is what they did with Euston in the 60s, isn't it? Not that any of us can remember. You know, apparently Euston was a beautiful station and they demolished it in the 60s to build, well, it's now Euston. Thank God, ben, ben, what's your name? Benjamin 
Oh, I think he saved St Pancras. Who was it? The statue's there in St Pancras. Um, 